I'm Andrea, a passionate DEI advocate and consultant on a mission. Join me in each episode as we celebrate diversity, ignite conversations, and craft workplaces and educational institutions where everyone thrives. This podcast is my commitment to making a meaningful impact on the world of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So are you ready? Let's get diversifused. Hey listeners, Andrea here. This is part two of Get Diversifused, episode 11, From Tragedy to Triumph, Navigating Identity and Overcoming Adversity with guest speaker Michael Gersh. The next two minutes and four seconds is the repeat of the introduction from part one. Part two of the episode will start up after that. Enjoy the second part of the conversation with Michael Gersh and me, and remember, stay diversifused. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Get Diversifused podcast. I'm your host, Andrea Horton Reachley, founder of Diversifuse DEI Consulting and a passionate DEI advocate and ally. This episode is all about navigating identity and overcoming adversity. My guest speaker today is Michael Gersh, hit by a drunk driver that killed his mother and nearly himself as an infant. Michael went on to found the Magic of Life Foundation. Despite breaking almost all his bones in the car accident, he became a collegiate swimmer, stand up comedian which I cannot wait to speak to him about, (laughs) college educator, author, professional speaker, and founder of a nonprofit organization. Michael has dedicated his life to trying to eliminate impaired driving so others don't experience the same pain as he and countless others, other families have, have gone through. The Magic of Life explores how he overcame tragedy, this book right here, this wonderful autobiography by Michael, explores how he overcame tragedy, grief, and depression throughout his life. Even though he lost his mother, he and his brother were raised by his father and Dolly, an incredible Jamaican woman who stepped to fill the the mother's role. He created the program called Jewish Born, Jewish Raised, which is a unique diversity program about his life. So welcome, Michael, to the Get Diverse Views podcast. Thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you for having me. That's a lot. That's all the time we have. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't follow that. that was, uh, but no, thank you very much for having me. Uh, this is very exciting. And uh, I'm always uh, happy and honored anytime I'm able to share my story and you know make a difference in, in society. Because I think if uh, we're able to bring some humor into life and make a difference in someone's life, then, then we're doing something pretty special. And uh, doing this on diversity uh, is is a, just another avenue of uh, sharing a, a purpose. But <laughs> I, I also remember I was doing a program in a high school, and I took the ferry to Long Island to go to the cemetery. And we're, there are families on the ferry for like a baseball tournament. And it made me think if my mom was still alive, what would my life be like? Be like? And that would drive you insane, all the what ifs. Yeah. And then you go, well, what Dolly's life be like? And all the people that knew her, you take that one catalyst of that car crash and you see how many lives were impacted because of her and into yeah. it. And you realize how lucky. I remember doing a high school, uh, middle school in Chicago and a girl came up to me and goes, would you go back in time and change anything? And I think if I, did, if I didn't have Dolly, it would be much easier answer of yes but then you have that go yeah i would love to have still my mom here but yet i have this dolly in this life here which isn't so bad you know in in a way and it was very difficult because you go yeah in a heartbeat to have my mom back but at the same time i have dolly and then i have this life and you give that up Mm because you're a better person and oh yeah uh you remind me of the drill sergeant you know and asking for help just for men doesn't mean you're soft means you're strong because mm-hmm. you identify something yourself that needs to be done and um you know even, yeah and not being afraid of it and it's been a blessing and even i know i didn't have the tools before to help with depression and coping and now that i do and know that i could count on you know go to my friends when you're having a bad day or you know the sense of humor will bounce back you know eventually uh, and knowing you had that support and, and that part's really nice. And, you know, and that was the, the blessing about the book because my friends were like, be a burden. You know, we, we don't want to go on your Facebook page and 
you know, write the the more you know those things that we see a lot, and it is sad. Because um, yeah, being through that grief and and all that stuff, um, yeah, I don't want anyone to go through that, uh, mm-hmm. especially you know through suicide and you know that depression and it's sad. And you no know, part of it, medication. Well, you know, medication's part of it, but counseling's the other half. And we both know yeah. if you get medicated, your brain chemistry is going to change. Then you're going to need up the dosage, then up mm-hmm. the dosage. But if you're not doing the other side and working on yourself, yeah. it's not going to work. Yeah. And 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 it was hard work because when I was done with that phase of my grief counseling in 2018, my counselor said, you look like a different person. And I felt like a different person. Uh, yeah. And, and yeah, when you realize you're the problem, you're going to fix it. And then, yeah, mm-hmm. I was very dedicated. I didn't want to feel that way anymore and um, work That's hard cool. and. And overcoming because even though I talk, I did my program, talk about my mom, I didn't really talk about the emotional side to it. And then mm-hmm. realizing if I share my story about depression and grief, again, I could change someone else's life and maybe that person will ask for help and so forth. And and that's an amazing thing to do. You know, if I have to, mm-hmm. you know, talk about my emotions and stuff, if that's the price to pay for someone to get help, then I'm all for it. Yeah. And, um, I, I, I'm right there with you. And so I love it when organizations have um, employee assistance programs uh, as part of their um, benefits uh, package, because a lot of them encompass um, a few free uh, therapy appointments. Um, and it's just, as you said, it, it, the, the, the strongest, the, the scariest and the strongest thing anyone can do, regardless of what sex or race you are um, is to ask for the help is to admit you not I wouldn't say admit, but to um, realize you need help and stepping out of your self-consciousness and um, a, a discomfort to ask for that help because uh, many people are afraid of being judged, being treated differently mm-hmm. and um, not realizing that them holding it in just kind of, it's just building up. To where they're either going to have a mental breakdown, uh, have suicidal tendencies and thoughts, and maybe even go through with it. You never know. Attempts um, and hopefully no successes. But um, and and it it starts to damage relationships, um, uh, whether they're work relationships or personal relationships. It, if if um, the longer someone uh, holds things in, it could damage relationships. I should say, right? Like, Knowing say. that, but it's also the the relationship within yourself. Right? Yes, and that, the way you and that's feel the about part it. damage because mm-hmm. it's one thing about I was doing the TED talk about saved by connections, but yeah. stay connected to you, and yes. you know, and that's one of it. And even Dolly said, you know, after my dad passed, when I was going through the hard times, was you need to have a foundation that you can stand on before you could be in a relationship and be with anyone. Because if yeah. you're not, if you don't have that foundation, mm-hmm. then the rest of it doesn't make a difference. And yeah, it wasn't happy. So when I tell people I'm happy, you know, I'm not looking if I date, you know, I don't want someone, oh, you make me happy. No, you make yourselves happy. Mm-hmm. You can add someone else to that happiness yeah. or immaturity or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> you know, but, you know, when someone goes, you know, they can make you maybe happier, but we have to be happy in ourselves before we let other people into our world. I, and, you know, hers is giving me that advice again. You need to have a solid foundation. And, yeah. and I went, I need to do what's right for me. Now, the other person, she didn't like it so much because I'm not going to wait for you. I'm like, you know what? I'm not asking you to. Yeah. There's the door, you know, go right there. Yeah. And she didn't see what I was going through. It was it last year? Yeah. Not this year, but a year ago, December. After like five years, never hearing from this woman, sends me an email because her dad passed. And she said, I finally mm-hmm. understand what you're going through. And, uh, and mm-hmm. it took me about three months to respond. Even though she goes, I'm not expecting a response. Now, the old me before counts and stuff would have responded like that day. I would have mm-hmm. been, oh, yeah, you're going to get it. you know. But it took me a few months. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, my God, I'm matured to respond. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember what I said, but I also thought you should, I didn't write this. I wanted to in a way. I said, you shouldn't have to go through your own dad's death to empathize with someone who's going through that. Exactly. I was doing a program at a high school uh, and we were filming it. And two hours before I got the call from my uh, aunt and my uncle, 
that my aunt, the doctor said she had like two days to live. And I was like, how am I supposed to do a program now? I was supposed to go to her mm-hmm. house too in Detroit. And when I told her I couldn't wow. come, she goes, oh, I knew you weren't coming, you know, this weekend. My brother was so upset. My brother was calling her names that I can't say on this program. Um, but, and I just, I was, I had, I had to do a program. I had to make people laugh. I had to do mm-hmm. this thing. Also, we were filming it. You had to put it aside. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then you look back, went, man, what a crappy thing for her to say. Here I told her I can't mm-hmm. come because my aunt's about to die. And all mm-hmm. she's is thinking about herself. You know, and, uh, you know, we all, but there's, but you can empathize, you can yeah. sympathize with someone, even though you didn't go through that situation. It goes back to mm-hmm. diversity and racism. You can still do that. Yeah. If you haven't been exposed to anti Semitism, mm-hmm. and even what you said before about, uh, we said about, you know, uh, suicide and those type of things. I remember October 6th happened, or 7th, like, you know, and I thought, do I need to go? Oh, the tree protection? of life? Is that? No, like in Israel, when Hamas oh, the, the, okay. the right? Mm-hmm. And I went, all right, because I, I, you don't know, and you fear for your safety, and mm-hmm. and I thought about that, but I also thought, here's a person, me, who sometimes will battle through depression. Do I need a firearm? Because I don't know in those cases, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I was having these discussions as a man to other men about that, and and it was like it was a refreshing, but also easy because I was like, I don't know. If I should, because you think about those things, right? You have those thoughts mm-hmm. Of, mm-hmm. Of, of, of those type of things. Like maybe I shouldn't have access to it um, mm-hmm. just in case you have that. Mm-hmm. And I still have one because, you know, you time will go on and, and so forth. But you want to mentally be there. And even though I went to the range with a buddy mm-hmm. and, you know, and you fire it off and, and, and those type of things. And but going back to what remind me of what you said about you know, the attempts and those type of things and having those thoughts. And I went, mm-hmm. okay, I don't need one right away. Yeah. You know, for that, it'd be okay. But, you know, I talked to French uh, uh, law officers, you know, mm-hmm. um, you know, other counselors uh, too. And it was like, okay, I'm going to hold off until I feel 100% ready if I can have it around. You know, if if I, it's a decision, right? You have choices and consequences. Yeah. And, you, and time you. goes on. And, because you want to be there, yeah, and 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 to, and to be that self-aware. I don't want to pat myself on the back, but I guess I am because for that, in, in a good way, on. realize that if you have one, you have those thoughts. How easy it would be in that one yes. case of I mean, um, of lowness, sleep, sort of, speak, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, I'm going, it's right there, done. Yeah, you know, and yeah. it's about. Training yourself and and being stronger than, than that, and then as mm-hmm. so stronger in terms of overcoming it, also asking for help and so forth. And my friend that I went shooting with goes, "If you got one and you were in that situation, you just text me. I'll come and get it." Yeah, those but are friends. We again, um, would you be with somebody in that frame of mind even want to text? That, that's... I would. You know what? I think I'm in that <laughs> relationship with myself and that awareness where it goes back to what I said, sending my family and friends back to the cemetery again. I couldn't do it to them. Yeah. And that's where it differs when, mm-hmm. yeah, I can make that. I could text them. I could call them. Yeah, because that's when you, yeah, you're thinking of others. others. And it's, yep. and, and that's so important when you, when people start getting into that frame of mind is like, well, what would my, you know, best friend think or my family think uh or what would they be feeling and going through um if i wasn't here if i did this um but going back to something you had said about the 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 woman who emailed you five years later about the um uh, about her father dying and, and all and i i loved how you said you waited a few days to respond um, I waited a few months, actually. Oh, oh few months. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I heard days. I heard oh, yeah. a few I months a few to respond. Months. <laughs> um, so it's very important to not respond, um, whether it's in person or via uh, the internet or whatever, to somebody's somebody that has offended you in some way. It's um, important to not respond out of emotion. So, uh, and that goes back to like, stop, think, and think before you reply. And sometimes it takes, you know, you have to walk away and think, you know, just separate yourself from it for a little while. Um, and, 
and com and compose yourself uh, because um, anger only brings another anger sometimes and in the heat of the moment and we say things that we could regret um, later and um, and this is any situation um, so it's um it's always good to stop and think before you respond whether it's through actions uh, verbally or or in writing. Um, especially in writing, because then it's never going away if it's on the internet. Right. <laughs> Even if you delete you'll, your you'll email. Wait, you know, what is it? Wait, it count 20 seconds or something before you, you hit send? I, I counted 90 days or so before I hit send <laughs> uh, on that. Hey, you know, the book that's the time you need it. That's the time yeah. you need I've always been a procrastinator, and I was like, but you're right. I didn't want to come up with emotion and, yeah. and bitter and those types mm -hmm. of things. You, you know, there's a side of you going, yeah, well, I want to respond right now, but it's like, you know what? H is not worth it. And it's mm -hmm. like, all right, well, it's not a big deal. Because in the, I went, like, huh, am, am I mature? Uh, in that regard, <laughs> it was kind of scary. Um, you know, <laughs> no, but it was a good thing. Like, and and like, who when, am I? Yeah. Who am I? Who am I? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but when it comes to organizations and educational institutions, like when it comes like teachers and, and supervisors, managers, leaders, um, it's always good to, um, to, uh, I forgot where I was going with this. <laughs> um, it happened to me. Yeah, That's I know. Okay. I'm like, I'm. <laughs> now, now you have it. Yeah, it brushed onto me. <laughs> but uh, it's always good to um, not respond in anger because, uh, and never assume, like, if it's a, you're in a conversation or someone says something in a, a meeting or in writing. Never, I mean, especially in writing, things can be misunderstood all the time mm -hmm. um, right. in work, work communication and everything. Um, and, um, but also it's, it's, it, one should never assume. So if you have questions, go to the person and ask, um, make it an educational moment. Uh, maybe they didn't realize it came off that way. Um, so I'm kind of putting a little DEI twist on, on your story, mm -hmm. here. but um it's it's just very important to never assume the worst um, right. because and, and make it an educational moment. And if that person isn't open to it, then then that's another story. But um, it's always good right. to to educate people, because just like you had said uh, from uh, your your college days, they didn't know because they never were, were um, left their small communities before. So they were, th this was their first time leaving that small community to still a, a small rural area, but university where mm -hmm. people from all over were coming. Right. And so they were getting that exposure for the first time, probably the first time in their lives, that, that um, daily exposure. And they were learning and, and, um, and the goods and the best. <laughs> and, right. um, yeah, so they go. Yeah, because they were like, I never met a Jewish pers person before. And I was like, great, I never met a hillbilly before either. <laughs> How are you? Uh, you know, again, you use the humor, right? Yeah. You, you have to, because that's the defense mechanism. Yeah. And they go, you know, what's culture and this and that. And it's like, mm -hmm. you're alone, you got to defend everything. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and just FYI, hillbilly can also be a kind of <laughs> derogatory in today, really? though I grew up saying it also. And so I was like, yeah. I. I recently learned that like a year ago. I was like, really? And I was like, oh, yeah. I never knew. <laughs> but, so and then when you're friends with them, it's a term of endearment when exactly, you're friends with them yes. after a while. <laughs> right? That is oh, true. That is you know, true. <laughs> I mean, that, and that comes within time, that, that relationship building, because then it's built on values and morals and you yes. have that understanding. And that was so great because if they never met a Jewish person before and then become friends and so forth, and then you're accepting of other people's values, cultures, those type of things. And you start to understand uh, it. Um, yeah. And I and think so with my background, it was much easier to, you know, teach people that or to, you know, or I don't want to say educate, but I guess that is a way, you know, because it was always natural to me. You know, I wasn't, mm -hmm. the Hollywood was always there. So it wasn't a strange thing where, you know, like we use, you know, eight years old, right? One day, you know, this you know black woman comes into her house. You know, when as an eight year old, you're already sort of, you know, you you already have certain thoughts and you know whatever. I was eight weeks, so all I've known is Dolly. You know, there yep. from my brother, my brother was three, 
So again, mm -hmm. still very young. So when it's natural and, and you grow up with that, it's like, oh, this is what life is. Then you realize, oh, other families aren't like this, right? And then, then, yeah. then it's all, you know, what, what do you mean, you know? And yeah. because you only knew so, what you knew in the household until you started yeah. going out into the world, like to school mm -hmm. and to, you know, your swim club and yeah. Right. So it's all those yeah. things. And uh, yeah. then you realize, oh, it's a little bit different. Then you realize, oh, I am pretty different. And you realize sometimes you kind of go, I had a much better upbringing than some of their families. Because Dolly, she treated us better, I think, than biological parents. And for an example, when it was cold by Miami standards, we'd swim outdoors and Dolly would, you know. So you're saying 80 down, degrees? Like, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah 75, <laughs> you know, strong wind. You know, we're talking maybe, maybe, maybe 60s, maybe. Um, she would stand by the edge of the pool with a towel. I would hop out. She'd wrap me in the towel, run, run, run with me in her arms like this. What? Oh car. man, I, right. I, I read that in the book, but I didn't realize she had you in her arms too. I was like, wow. Like this, you know, running like, you know, carrying <laughs> firewood or something. And the car was warm, had hot chocolate or tea in the thermos. You know, I didn't yeah. see any of the white bi biological parents doing it for their own kids. <laughs> yeah, we no, were they're like, hurry up. <laughs> yeah. Did she spoil us? Yeah. Did, were we worthy of it? Of course. Let me look at us. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, <laughs> but that's, that's how it was. And, uh, yeah, it was, um, you look back, you know, being this age now, you look back on, on fondly of, of it because when you're in it, you realize uh, this is just life. And sometimes you're like, oh, yeah. it sucks. You know, okay. Can't, can't go to this person's house, but it was always like my dad, Hey dad, can I do this? Go ask Dolly. You know, and then Dolly would have final say most of the time, uh, in the house. Sometimes my dad would too, but. Yeah, but it was very much that mother father role. That's awesome. That's awesome. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, and that was very important that they got along too um, from the get go because um, and and that Dolly had enough confidence in herself to tell your dad in the beginning, like, hey, you know, I'm going to need to be in control if this is going to work. <laughs> you know, what I'm and because um, if if she never did that, then um, it would have been. Uh, could have taken a right, lot longer yeah. or never have meshed. Especially with my brother, because she would say one thing and, and then my dad would come home and Jeff would go running to my dad and tell on her. And, uh, you know, and then he would say, well, this doesn't work. But that was early on. But my dad, at that early time, she even said that in that first year she was there, he barely said a word, expected going through the grief and, and stuff, mm -hmm. never getting help and, you know how to channel it and then he, he just focus on what's on the best thing for the boys and i think at that point when she laid down the law he would i'm gonna guess he was probably so drained by grief and trauma probably just went okay you know just one of those things you know and 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 that's what happened um because you know is it worth fighting and you know maybe he just went okay she's right you know for this to work and even then she was still very much an employee you know, um, it wasn't, you know, part of that family because she was still being paid by my grandparents, you know, uh, for that, even though it was yeah. like, you know, I don't know how soon that happened. My brother was three, so maybe, you know, a year in or, or so, but she even said a year in, you know, um, uh, you know, he still wouldn't talk. You know, my mom's name wasn't really mentioned. So when that's the environment and you grew up mm -hmm. with that, you know, and you realize, you know, that's, that's the uh, norm, but it shouldn't be the norm. And yeah. uh yeah, so lots of different interesting facets of, of that family dynamic and how it came apart, but mm -hmm. but then it just became family and it just mm -hmm. whatever happened happened and it was just a natural type of organic thing. So last question. Uh tell us about your advocacy work against impaired driving and the impact you hope to make through your initiatives. Well, I've been speaking for almost 30 years doing this program, uh, The Magical Life, going to schools and high, uh, colleges and the military bases. And, of course, uh, uh, the, as I mentioned before, the Stoke, Stoke Court here in Ohio to DUI offenders. And yeah. the, the thing is, is making sure I don't want other families to go through what I went through or our family went through. So it is humor involved, audience participation. I think for the first 20 minutes or so, you get to play. And they they know my personality a little bit. So I think if you get into the heavy stuff right away, they don't know, they don't know who I am. And yeah, 
So if I make them laugh first, and then you get into this, and then I talk about my mom, when they're all leaning forward and, and you know you have them, and, and yeah. it's fun because if you can make them laugh, and then you can take them anywhere you want on this journey. And it's sadness and you know it's emotional, but you still put humor throughout it because sometimes I need it, they need it when you get to the serious mm-hmm. stuff. Um, but it's inspired my mom, dedicated to my mom, because standing up for her. As I said it before, I you know I, I can't let her death be for nothing. And if her death can um, create a change in someone else's never to drive impaired to harm themselves or someone else on the road, then then it's worth it. And um been doing it for a long and it's in this purpose. You know, I was kept yeah. alive for a purpose. Yeah. And and you do a lot of examination on yourself, that self-awareness of why am I here? And mm-hmm. that's why I was probably kept alive. One of the reasons uh, to make a difference in, in someone's life and to do it. However, you know, there's days you don't want to do anymore because, like, I'm really making a difference. Mm-hmm. And then you then you go do the program and you see that one person you make a difference with, and you went, okay. If even if even if it's one out of thirty mm-hmm. that night, then it's a win because that person's yeah. going to go go. I'm never going to drive impaired again because yeah. not because of the law or the DUI cost ten thousand dollars. Is because they heard my story. The very first time I did it, there was a 19 year old girl stopped me in the parking lot and she said, oh, Thank wow. you. Thank you for making me realize my son needs me more than alcohol. What do you say to that? I mean, all I did was wow. share my story yeah. and you make this impact. I remember one time, uh, and I wear my Kiss shirt. I'm a huge Kiss fan. Uh, as you, uh, I don't know if you got to that part in the book. I have. Uh... <laughs> it's my personality, right? And and I remember one guy was on crutches, and, he, and I'm holding the door open for him. And he goes, oh, this is going to be BS. And I go, I hope not. I'm your speaker. And, uh, <laughs> and then he laughed. <laughs> but he was the first guy afterwards to come up, buy a book, give me a handshake, um, you know, share a little bit about his story. That's the guy I still do this program for. And he was probably in his mid-60s. You know, and mm-hmm. he has that behavior of, you know, and first time DUI offenders, on average, I don't know where the study, the research comes from, they drive drunk 80 to 90 times before they're caught the very first time. Now, you can't go out and shoot a gun up 80 to 90 times in, mm-hmm. in no one, you know. Um, so it's only the first time they're caught. And it's like mm-hmm. playing Russian roulette. And it's like, how do you stop this? How can, you know, your life, my life change someone else's? And when you do that, then you kind of go, yeah, it feels good to make a difference in someone's life. And and that's part of the, the work. And I don't really call, you know, it's more of a calling. You know, I, I have my work at Kent State University. That's work. Then I go do this program and you go, this is purpose. And and that's a huge difference. It's so like the stuff you, you do. You mm-hmm. work and then you have purpose. Yep. Yep. This is my purpose, my diverse diverse yeah. consulting. Our purpose. Talking sometimes exceeds what we want, right? We may mm-hmm. not want to do it, but you kind of go, this is why I am this person. And you kind of go, this audience needs me tonight or, or whatever, or this person, wherever you want to do a life coach, consulting, you know, you're giving back to the community for a bigger um, reason. It's bigger than, it's bigger than me. It's about yeah. them out there to keep other people alive and not go through this pain. I don't want people to re- to know this anger and sadness and, and stuff. It's hard. It's a hard life. Mm-hmm. I'm 53. It's every day you wake up. Now, I just realized in counseling, I thought for 47 years, I'm a victim and survivor of drunk driving crash. Yeah. I'm not. Uh, it's a part of me, but it's not all of me. And it took me a yeah. long time to realize. It. And then once I got through that and realized that, my program even changed a little bit because you realize, okay, it's not all of me. It's just a part of my life. And it's, it's um, one of your identities and stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you know, you can separate yourself. Now, you know, I got my you know, photography, you got comedy, um, you know, the book, trying to write another one. I wrote a short play about a 10 minute play. I have a friend that's a playwright. And and uh he said, You write 10 minute plays. So the first one I wrote was um about my dolly and my grandmother meeting for the very first time. So about the tea and that experience and it started from being getting in the house till when she met me in, in the crib. And, you know, so you have all these things that's a part, you know, 
sums of the was it parts of the sum i forget whatever the expression is sum of the and yeah i can't remember the expression <laughs> yeah people yeah. listening and watching go look it up and let us yeah know some of the um, parts yeah <laughs> yeah some of the parts uh, yeah. it sounds like math i'm going to avoid yeah. it all together <laughs> but that's part of, of the work of about uh impaired driving because it, you know it's just like when it goes back to like diversity and and, and stereotypes and, and you're being called you, you know what it feels like I want, to, I want to save people not going through it or causing it. I tell mm-hmm. people, don't be the cause of someone's pain and suffering. Be the cause of someone's yeah. happiness. Um, and it's not only, you know, I do my program for three main reasons. One, for my mom. Uh, two, for other people that have been impacted by drunk driving that don't have the ability to share their own story. And three, so they don't have to. It's my life. I don't want this to be theirs. And... Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's extra special. You know, I don't do it for money or for glory or whatever. I do it to make this world a little bit better. And when you do it that way and make a difference, then, then uh, you know, I always wanted my mom to be, I always wanted to be a son my mother would be proud of. Don't do it every day. I'm not perfect. Yeah. I know. No, I know you're thinking, yeah, yeah, you are. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> I, I can break it to you. I'm not. But, you know, I try. I try. And, you know, I have my values and principles. But for my mom, I think from Dolly and my dad and I think if if I live within those values and morals and I'm doing something okay I think she would be proud of you You, well thank you you're welcome you're welcome um so sorry I lied there's one more question (laughs) 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 how can individuals foster empathy and understanding towards those who have experienced discrimination and adversity Wow. What are, yeah, that's what are a, your that's thoughts? A, that's a hard one, right? Yeah. I, well, I, in your experience, like when it comes to uh, um, yeah. stereotyping, anti-Semitism, um, not understanding the family dynamics. I, yeah, I think it's about, would you want to be treated that way? Mm-hmm. You know, I think the answer is no. Because if you're calling someone names and so forth and you know you're hurting them, and you reverse the roles, would you want to be treated that same way? And I'm willing to bet people it, it's no. And and to have an open mind and understanding, because even what you said, you never know what people are going through. Yeah. And we have to have that empathy and that patience with, and understanding with, with people. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it comes back to that golden rule. I, you know, I, I think that yes. in terms of how we would want to be treated. And we know mm-hmm. we're treated that way. It's horrible. And and I don't want other people to feel that way because I we've been through it. We know it. And I yeah. think people have to have that understanding. And we have to treat people better. We're, we're in a very weird place in our society where we think it's okay not to treat people well. And that has to change. I think we're better than that as a society. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if it could start with two, three people and you build momentum from there, then, then okay. Are we going to get everyone? No. We know that. And I think that's okay. Do we all have to get along and hold hands? No, because there's going to be those. Be nice, but yeah. We're talking about the bigger stuff. We're talking about the bigger picture with DEI. Let's talk about football and fans, OSU, Michigan. They're never going to get along, right? (laughs) We're talking about racism and hatred. Let's look at that part and how many fights and stuff breaks out in the Oh, my gosh, yeah. Ohio State fans can't even say the word Michigan because of their hate for that, you know, for that school. So, wow. you know, so let's take a, a, a let's look at sports for a second. That's but true. I think, you know, as racism and, and people of color and, and all this stuff, I think it comes back to would you want to be treated that way? And I, I think if you ask people, I think the answer would be no. And it's like, OK, if you wouldn't be treated that way, then don't say those things. Don't act out. Don't do those things. Now, easier said than done, as we know, because yeah. yeah. it comes back to. I don't want to say brainwash, but you know, sometimes if you're in a cult, let's yeah. take um, Proud Boys, let's take the KKK. That's all I know. It's been mm-hmm. ingrained in their brains. Then, yeah. then they think that behavior is okay until they can be exposed to something else, hopefully. And we know yeah. there's people that quit, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, you would think it'd be easy, you know, but I, yeah, let's, you know. Uh, it is hard, hard, especially people. sometimes it takes a whole moving away. Like, yeah. I think of like, right. uh, individuals who have been incarcerated and they get and they're released um they get released back to the same neighborhoods to to their family and it's like 
they have to change their situation, right. um, their environment, um, or be if they're not strong enough with the will to to not be influenced. And it, it's um, it's hard. It's hard. Yeah, that support and, system has to be there, right? And yeah. then they go back because it's like a warm blanket to them. That's yeah. all they know. And that's yeah. the sad part. Because then, it, then it's and then they They're go back to prison or whatever, because that's again they feel safer there. Yeah. But on the, and that's scary, mm -hmm. you know. And talk about mm -hmm. PTSD, you know, you get that way, and you know. Yeah. And but we both know there's some cases where very successful people you overcome and, and stuff. And it takes a strong person for that okay. to be willing to the power to change. You'd be willing to do that. Yeah, and ask and for the help. You, yeah, and I think when you make that change for it to become better. It's uh, the reward sweeter in, in a way when you overcome, but it's not. And we both know it's not easy. They have, they have to be willing yeah. to work at it. Yeah. But you know, um, let's go back to the golden rule and let's treat people with respect and dignity and, and you know those types of things on on the surface. I agree. I in almost all my pockets, I bring up the golden rule and also the platinum rule. Like golden rule, I think should be taught from, you know. Uh, birth on almost you know uh but also the platinum rule light and i heard the, about the platinum rule uh a few months ago i was in a webinar um a dei webinar and the plat so the golden rule is treat others how you, uh, you want to be treated the platinum rule is treat others how they want to be treated because uh there's different cultures and things like that and so we have to be um empathetic and, and learn you know, always learning uh, and, um be open to learning about new experiences and cultures and also I was like, wow, I, I had never heard the platinum rule before. So, um, but to me, the golden rule is the basis and then the platinum rule is one step up. So um, I agree with you about, um, uh, you know, if, if you don't feel, if you wouldn't want to be treated that way, don't do it, you know? Right. Um, and, and also I know we're uh, very over. So let's, um, uh, before I talk about key takeaways, how can people get a, get a hold of your book? Uh, if they want to purchase okay. your wonderful book here and how can they contact you if, if they uh, want to invite you for a speaking engagement or want uh, to get connected to your uh, uh, Magic Life Foundation? Right now, the website, there was a problem with the website, so it's down. I'm trying to oh. redo it. I'm having issues with it. Uh, okay. One day there was an update on WordPress and it kind of disappeared. <laughs> so oh. It was like a 503. So I'm trying to revamp it and kind of rebrand okay. where it's one website for speaking comedy author photography so but for now they can get a hold of me through linkedin you know just look me up michael gersh uh facebook mm -hmm. is also michael gersh so those are, and then email wise it's uh g-e-r-s-h-e -E underscore m as a michael at msn.com until i can figure out how to get this website back i mean i have the template I'm still having some issues because <laughs> I'm not a computer person. Yeah. Um, so eventually we'll get there. And I apologize for people when it's down, but social media is, until that's up. Because then it'll be michaelgersh.com. Um, okay. Because I don't need I don't need a dedicated page for the foundation anymore. I could just put it onto one page. Um, because I, I you know, now doing so much more and uh, you know, between those different facets. Um <laughs> On many different things, apparently, and uh, <laughs> you know, um, so yeah, social media just you know, they could just Google my name, um, okay. In the book, uh, they could, yeah, they could go on Amazon, it's on uh, Amazon, uh, The Magical Life, yeah, mm -hmm. Michael Gersh. Uh, if people want like autographed copies, you know, and I'll personalize it, just email me, they're, they're $25 uh, for shipping and handling, um, and uh, you know, I'll personalize it and sign it and which means it, it loses its value very quickly once I do that. Um, <laughs> oh um, man, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you can't sell it now. Well nope. uh -oh. um, has to be in your back table every time you do a podcast, I want to be me. Uh, but yeah, Facebook, um yeah, because then Michael Gersh, um there's a photography page. Uh but if you link if you connect with me on Facebook, then you know, you could follow me on my photography, uh, even Fine Art America. You can see my photos on there. Um, but yeah, the website, yeah, it's, it's been a problem for like a month because <laughs> okay. I hit update and oh. then I went, where, where did it go? <laughs> and <laughs> so I just created a new one and it's overdue uh, anyway. Okay. But 
we'll right. have links on there for the TED Talk, and my nice. second one will be out soon. So just just stalk me at Michael Gersh, and then you know, okay. Facebook will, yeah. will be the way. Cool. And um, I I feel you with the five hundred four that's happened to me before too. So, <laughs> um, I don't get it? But, yeah, okay. it's like what did I do? So, but um, all right. So before we go, let's talk about some key takeaways for our listeners today. We um, talked about uh, resilience in the face of adversity. So we explored Michael's remarkable journey from tragedy to triumph, highlighting the resilience and strength he demonstrated in overcoming immense challenges, including the loss of his mother and facing anti-Semitism and racism. We talked about the power of identity. We talked about the complexities of identity as Michael shared his experience of being raised by Dolly, a Jamaican woman in a white Jewish household, offering profound insights into the intersectionality of race, culture, and heritage. We talked about confronting discrimination. Uh, we uh, talked about uh, we, perspectives on confronting and combating discrimination firsthand as Michael shared his encounters with anti-Semitism and racism during his um, youth and college years and his advocacy efforts to address impaired driving. We talked about finding purpose and making an impact. Um, Michael, uh, we talked about how Michael transformed personal tragedy into a driving force for positive change, dedicating his life to advocating against impaired driving and inspiring others through his speaking engagements, comedy and writing. And we talked about embracing diversity and empathy we learned about the importance of empathy, understanding, and embracing diversity as we navigate the complexities of identity at work and just general life towards creating a more inclusive and compassionate society. Some possible next steps for our listeners. Um, explore Michael's program, uh, Jewish Born, Jamaican Raised, and consider participating or supporting this mission. Reflect on your own experiences of identity, yes, <laughs> and adversity, and consider how you can channel challenges into opportunities for growth and advocacy. And take action against impaired driving by supporting organizations like Michael's and initiatives dedicated to raising awareness and preventing such tragedies from happening again. All right. So with that, that's the end of our podcast. Thank you so much today uh, for listening and make sure to um, keep uh Keep listening. Uh, our next this episode will be uh, released on April 18th. So if you're listening now, it's our either April 18th or after. So, but um, I will be marketing it to let people know. Um, all right. So thank you so much, Michael, for being our guest today. It has been lovely talking with you and about your story of uh, tragedy and triumph and and perseverance and just it's very empowering and impactful. So thank you so much for for being our guest today on Get Diverse Diffused. Thank you for the opportunity. And for those listening, happy belated April Fool's Day. Yes. <laughs> Is that a joke? <laughs> but, you know, I really appreciate you know, the, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about like the diversity in Dolly in in in, in depth. So um uh it's been an honor. Thank you so much. So we'll let you go today, listeners. Bye. Now go out there and make a difference. And as always, for more strategies on building inclusive workplaces and communities, check out Diverse Diffuse. We're here to guide you on your DEI journey. Make sure to visit our website at diversediffuse.com and follow us on social media for the latest happenings, blog posts, tips, and events.